So, uh, we're really fortunate, pretty lucky that just kind of the stars aligned. And it just so happens that David Ng is here today, uh, was in Spain for a conference, uh, and just happens to be an expert on systems thinking, type of which we don't get in town very often. Um, so he's going to expand on the ideas that we introduced and looked at in Unit 1, and uh, from there I'll let you take it away. Great, thank you. Um, so for those of you who like to follow along with the slides, you can go to coldmalling.com slash common slash publications. I've written it up here. And uh, we're just going to have a little fun today. So we have, um, this is a talk that I actually wrote for this class. And there's a context for this now because you have a test coming up and nothing that I say is going to be on your test. So why, why should you listen to me at all? Because you don't have to be here. You could actually now leave. Well, what I'm going to say is that the sort of experience that I've had with system thinking, because I, like you, I was a business student. I've been an undergraduate in business. I have an MBA. I have a PhD program. But when I joined IBM, after 12 years, I encountered a person named Steve Heckel, who was saying these outrageous things, and I said, how could you say these things? This is not what they teach us in business school. And he said, you need to go learn some systems thinking. And so this talk is knowing better via systems thinking. And I'm going to give you an outline of some of the content that we have. Um, so before I introduce myself, the reason that I'm, at, I'm in Spain is that uh, we have members actually here in the front row from the uh, Creative Sustain, the Creative, sorry, CSRP Institute, the Creative Systemic Research Platform Institute, um, and they've, uh, they're putting a base in, in Mora de Ebra in Tarragona. And so uh, we have a conference, and so um, we have people here from around the world, and uh, we just happen to all be here, and we brought them to the campus. So uh, if you want to come meet us at lunchtime, we can do that. If you want to come to the 2 o'clock talk, we can also do that. So this is me. Uh, this is my family. Um, this 37, I'll give you, oh, this is what being at school too long does to you. So when I was in graduate school, University of British Columbia, I met my wife, uh, my, my girlfriend at that point. And, uh, and when we got married, so business school teaches you to be very rational. Things have to make sense. One of the things that they teach you about that when you do PhD level economics is that the world is not rational. It doesn't always make sense. So when you were getting married, and you make this declaration that you're going to be married forever. Does that make any sense? And so, being a grad student and doing this stuff with my wife, I said, okay, so we know all the laws of the land. When we marry, we'll marry for forever, as they say. But we have this tradition, which is, rationally, what we should do is every year, we go back and we decide if we still want to be married. One day every year, we come back and we say, do you still want to be married for one year? And we've done that 37 times. So this, this one is with my family. So for those of you who have problems in your relationship, you can think about it that way. Do I still want to be with this person for one more year? So that's what rationality is. Now, what, what does business school say? Do you have contracts that work forever? No, you have contracts that work for periods of time. This is one way of working through it. So as I said, I'm here with the Creative Systemic Research Platform. I was president of the International Society for the System Sciences, which is about the 70th meeting. So um, it's been a while since I've been there. I had 28 years at IBM. I worked in management consulting. Um, there's a lot of jobs at IBM in 28 years. But the biggest one I did was management consulting. Um, I also did uh, market development work. Market development work at IBM is not finding the first customer. It's finding the second customer. So for those of you who are thinking about starting up your own businesses or, or, or running a small business, at IBM what we learned is the most important thing is the customer. If you do not have a customer, you do not have a business. Until you get that first customer, and the first customer is always interesting because when you're a company the size of IBM, you want to get that first customer and the customer does not pay. 
And why do you do that? You do that because you want to learn from the customer. The second customer then becomes the challenge and the third customer and the fourth customer after that because what you learn from the first customer may not be applicable. However, the second customer pays. And that's where we start making money. Uh, I was also in headquarters planning. It started my job at IBM and the joke was I started at the top of the company and worked my way down. Um, and, and actually that's a great way to work in a company because when I, I started in the company, uh, I was straight out of university and I went into headquarters and you think that that is what you want to be is headquarters. At IBM that is not true. The most important jobs at IBM are the ones that are facing the customer. So if you had a choice between being the, uh, the general manager of IBM Canada or having Air Canada as a customer, Air Canada is a much better much better place to be because you own the whole account. And the customer tells you, and what's the president, what's the general manager of the company supposed to say? The customer has said he does this. If we do not do this, we will lose the business. So who has more power there? So when you're thinking about jobs, the number one thing that I, I, I would hope that you would think about, what is my visibility to the client? Because when you have a job that is facing the customer, you are really important to the business. And if they ever have to lay you off, they're going to lay, people, they're going to lay their customers off too at the same time. So think about that. Um, I've taught in many places. I'm working on my, this is my uh, slower speaking pace. Um, so if I, if I have my friends here who are going to throw things at me if I speak too quickly. So I'm going to try to go over some content for you. So what do I mean by knowing better? Then I'm going to talk about system thinking, one description, which is, uh, I used to teach system thinking in the style of Russ Acoff, and I stopped doing that about three, four years ago, because I started another research project. But I'm going to start from that. I'm going to talk about the different traditions there are in system thinking, because system thinking is not one thing, it is many things. Um, then the contemporary approaches, and this is the system changes learning circle that we have in Toronto and the research we do at the CFRT Institute. And then if you want to, if you're interested in contacting me or talking to me, you can find me on LinkedIn, you can find me on Twitter, you can find me anywhere, you can email me and we can always have messages online. And also, I can direct you to people closer than in Europe because I live in Toronto. Okay, this is the map of ignorance. The map of ignorance was uh, created at the, college, at the University of Arizona College of Medicine. When you go see a doctor and the doctor says, you have cancer, the answer usually has to be, yes, I'm sure that you have cancer. Because as a doctor, you can't have these patients saying, well, I'm not really sure. You have to make that decision and provide that. But doctors don't know everything. And the College of Medical Ignorance actually teaches, that, teaches the students who are doctors that they don't know everything, that science does not know everything. So we start off here with unknown knowns. All the things you don't know, you know. And so if all of a sudden we got a flood in this room, all those people who have haven't gone swimming in 10 years will all of a sudden remember how to swim. Because there's all these unknown knowns that we know about and we just don't think about them. We have the known unknowns, all the things you know you don't know. This is a good place to be. If you know you don't know, you do research. That's a really good place to be. From there, we have errors. All the things you think you know, but don't. If you think you know, but you don't, how do you correct yourself? The only way to get through this is to work in groups and work with teams, and you need people who think differently from you, because you need someone to tell you you're wrong. I travel with my wife a lot, she tells me I'm wrong quite often. I listen sometimes. <laughs> we have the unknown unknowns, all those things you don't know you don't know. This is where system thinking is really important. If you don't know you don't know, then how is it you're supposed to actually do something? 
If you're looking for a new business opportunity, people say, oh, you know, this will never work. You know, it's, it's like the old story, you know, when computers were first invented, they thought, well, maybe we'll have 100 computers in the world. And they just don't know, because it's something so new. And then we have the last two, the taboos and the denials. Dangerous, polluting, or forbidden knowledge, things that you will not discuss because it's too painful. Um, denials are too painful so you can know you don't. And these are the areas where, when you're doing system thinking, we end up with these sorts of uncomfortable truths we end up having to face. There's this famous, so this is from Ian Mitroff, who is a colleague that we work with in Berkeley, and he likes this one quote from Thomas Pinchon. If they can get you asking the wrong questions, they don't have to worry about the answers. And this unfortunately is the world we're in. So we take, you've all taken statistics, you know what a type 1 error and a type 2 error is, right? So a type 1 error is a false positive. So if we're doing a drug test, okay, so the, the, does this drug work or it doesn't work? A false positive says the drug works, but actually it doesn't. Because it's an experiment, this is science. Type 2 error, a false negative. Okay, so you can do the test and say the drug doesn't work, but actually it does work. So you've made an error there. The type 3 error that mathematicians have gone with is tricking ourselves. The unintentional error of solving the wrong problems precisely. And that's usually through ignorance or faulty education or unreflected practice. You haven't thought through this enough. And so what we often do in system thinking is, is really, how do we ask the right question? Because if you spend all your time working on the wrong question, then you're going to get nowhere. So unfortunately, now we have what Ian Mitroff calls a type 4 error, which is tricking others. Unintentional error of solving the wrong problems. And so what happens in today's world, particularly through social media, is people want you to focus on the wrong question. So watch out for this. People are trying to mislead you when you go, oh, I, I understand that question and I understand that answer and it all makes sense. But sometimes they're trying to mislead you. So we have all these types of errors that you need to understand and think about when, when you're looking at the world. Um, from here, we have three learnings that we have. Learning why, learning how, and then learning when, where, and who. And these go back to the Greek traditional um, uh, virtues. So learning why episteme, epistemology, is a why question. Generally, how does the world work? And this tends to be very analytical. It's universal. So you have Newton. Why does the apple fall from the tree? And it's because of gravity. Technique. This is learning how. This is craft or technical knowledge. So when you're actually working with your hands, working on techniques, these sorts of things, it's a group sort of thing. You work in communities of practice, and that's how you work together. However, what we should be looking at is learning when, where, and whom, which is phronesis, prudence, common sense. Because there's often places and times when you go, I understand this is why you're doing something. I understand how to do it, but it's wrong. It could be wrong for moral reasons, it could be wrong for social reasons, but again, if they get you answering the wrong answer, they, if they have the wrong question, then you're going to be focused and going down a bad route. So let's talk about what system thinking is. Okay. Uh, this is a definition of system thinking from Russ Acoff. Uh, my friend who is a student of Russ Acoff says that he wrote, the same, he wrote one book and then rewrote the same book 25 times. Um, so you can see that uh, he gets well cited. But a system is a whole that cannot be divided into independent parts. Every part of the system has property that loses when separated from the system. Every system has some properties, the essential ones that none of the parts do. So Russ Acoff would usually give the definition of an automobile, which has the function of transportation. So when you look at the system as a whole, you have the automobile, and you, you have the engine. If you take the engine out of the automobile, the automobile will not work. Right? Now the engine in itself doesn't actually have a function unless you put it in the automobile. It's just a piece of metal. 
And then every system has some properties, the essential ones that none of the parts do. And so the essential is what you get into. Is it essential? And in business, very much what we do is we look at, do we really need to do that? So if a, a, a cigarette lighter in a car is not essential, there's a lot of features in a car that are not essential. It has to run, it has to get you somewhere, that's the essential function. An environment of a system consists of a variable which can affect all the system states. Now this is a little confusing, but what happens when people talk, often talk about system, and then you have you define what your system is, as a, you can define a business, like as this university could be a system, and then you have the environment which is everything outside. Uh, but there's actually this field that they call where you can actually influence things. So if we take the university as a system, of course, the environment is everything, but then what could the university influence? And so it influences students, it influences general education, uh, upstream, downstream. It doesn't necessarily influence the taxes, so you have these sorts of, of constraints about how far you go with the system. Everything is not connected. So people would say a system is connected to everything. No, there are things that are closer and farther on systems. A system contains multiple subsystems. So we have a system of interest, we take the university, and you could say, well, there's a, a, there's a research component, there's a teaching component, but also you can do, go the other direction, which is you have a system of interest. So you have the university here, the university is within a country, it is within a financial system. So system thinking gets you thinking not only about what is inside the system, but more importantly, what is outside the system and how those things are connected. Now this is the one quote, I usually don't like doing these um, quotes, but this is mine. System thinking is a perspective on parts, holes, and their relations. So I tend to not like the def defining systems because people fight over it's not a system, that's not a system, but system thinking is a perspective. And when you say it's a perspective, that means that every one of you in this room has a definition of what you think a system is. So when I say it's a university, that means different things to different people. So it's all a perspective. But it's about parts, holes, and their relations. The most basic ideas are function. Function is contribution of the part to the whole. So as an example, you would have research, and then you have the university. So what is the function of research at the university? The function is to keep knowledge building. You have structure, which is an arrangement of space. And so you could ask, well, how does the university research relate to the university teaching? And it could be separate, but there could be a relationship. A process is an arrangement in time. Arrangement in time, so when you're talking about, well, probably you need some teaching before you do some uh, research. Uh, every, every research paper that are written to the literature review because you have to look backwards and connect all of those. And then behavior is a system change that initiates other events. And so we have the system as a whole, and you have some actions that influence that, and some consequences happen all the time. So those are the basic ideas of systems. And the idea of parts and wholes is something that when you're actually taking a university, they tend to put you all into parts, right? And so when you get the capstone course at the end, you're trying to bring all of these things together. You've been studying accounting, you're studying finance, you're studying operations, but in the end, if you have a capstone course, if you have a thesis, they're trying to bring it all together and put things together. Okay, in authentic system thinking, synthesis precedes analysis and then the painting whole is appreciated. And so when we talk about uh, synthesis, synthesis is putting things together. Analysis is taking things apart. Russ Acoff, who I like for doing this, he says, if we're going to do real system thinking, we need to think about how we put things together before we take things apart. So we think about the human body. If we think about the whole, so I'm standing in front of you, I have my parts. I have my heart, I have my stomach, I have all these parts. But that's not really what matters. You can work on my heart, you can work on my, on my body, you can work on, other, on my limbs. But what really matters is how it's all put together. So, always interesting relationship between me and my doctors, when I talk about my doctors. 
because the, the, what the doctor will ask you, the doctors don't tell me, they don't just look inside. You go to your doctor, your doctor says, oh, you feel sick. Yes. What's different? They're asking about the system that you are in. What's happened around you? Have you has your family changed? Are you getting stressed from school? These sort of things are systems, but things that happen outside the system more than happen inside the system. And so sometimes we change things outside the system as opposed to doing that. So you identify the containing hole of which the thing is to be explained. So my running joke is I need to lose you know, 10 pounds, 10 kilos, however you want to do it. But uh, identify the containing hole of which the thing is to be explained as a part. Um, when, uh, when I hit 60, I am over 60, when I hit 60, I went to the doctor and I had a checkup and uh, the doctor said, you haven't come and seen me in five years. And I said, yes, because the things he told me five years ago, I haven't yet done. So there was no point in coming to see you. And she says, okay, so you should actually, uh, we did all these tests, I said, well, you know, your cholesterol is a bit high. Uh, one of the programs we have in the hospital is, um, is uh, a, a research program called Portfolio Diet. It is a vegan diet. Do you want to try that? Okay, if I'm going to do, get my cholesterol down, I'll try the vegan diet. Okay, so I try the vegan diet. Now think about this. I traditionally am the one who's been cooking in the family. And so my sons have been all happy, you know, they really like my Chinese beef stew, you know, they like me cooking all these other things, you know, Thanksgiving dinner, we just had Thanksgiving. Um, so um, they like all these things, and now I'm vegan, which is mean when I cook food, I don't actually taste it anymore because it's not mine. That is the containing hole that I'm in. My family and the cooking that's there. So telling me to go vegan has all these other impacts. Explain the behavior of properties of containing whole. Okay, so what's happened now is my sons have learned to cook for themselves because they find that I'm an unreliable person to provide them with meat. I'll go shopping for them, that's not a problem, but if they really want meat, they have to learn to cook and they've actually gotten quite good at it. Then explain the behavior of property, the thing to be explained in terms of the proper rules or functions within the containing whole. Okay, so now my function as a cook in my family, I'm no longer the cook in my family. They cook for themselves. That's changed everything. So that's how systems thinking approaches a way of looking differently. Okay, there are many traditions in systems thinking. Um, so there are cybernetics. Um, the cybernetics is uh, it was based off information. A lot of the things that you would see in this domain are there are books like uh, The Brain of the Firm or The Heart of Enterprise and those sort of things. And they take the ideas that the organs in your body and they model it on that and the information that transfers between them. You have general systems theory that says we should learn from biology. And what they're looking for are things that are common across biology and social systems and other types of systems. We have system dynamics that is mathematical that tries to look at relationships and how they work together. Soft and critical systems works on human systems primarily. And a lot of the critical systems thinking is about how we should change, why we should change, systems that work and systems that don't. Uh, the labor side of cybernetics work comes from these people. And the labor cybernetics work uh, focuses on how, when you actually intervene in a system, are you part of the system? So you, when you're observing the system, you're never outside, you are part of the system. And how does that have an impact? Uh, we have learning systems that came out of the topic critical systems. And from here, in the, in, the, in the learning systems world, what we're interested in is not just the way the system is. It's we're interested in systems that learn. So designing a system that optimizes, as you would do in an operations management class, is different from designing a system that learns. So you can't optimize a system. So talking about my experience again at IBM, if you think that you're building something for a customer, you go, I know what the customer wants, I will build that product. And then you get to that product in the end, and it's, the customer says, I know that's what I asked for, but that's not what I want. You might not want to optimize on building that system. You might want to optimize instead, or you might want to have a learning system, and this is what agile development has done. Agile development allows people to come in and talk to the customers more frequently as they're building the product. And when they do that, then it's like the first meeting was, oh, that's very interesting. I see what you built. That's not what I want. 
That's great. We're only 10% into the project. We built a learning system. We could learn and, and change things as we go along. The newest field is a complexity theory where we look at how complexity works. It used to be, when we were talking about the 1970s, 1980s, the idea of complexity and chaos was not okay, as they said. Chaos was a bad thing. And then there was this term where it's like, well, there's chaos in the world, how do you deal with that? And so that's another branch. So of these systems, the ones that I like the most, I like general systems theory. So when I'm looking at social systems, as I work with normally, I try to learn from biology. I learn from the philosophy critical systems. I learn from learning systems. And in the new research that we've been doing, we've been using uh, and adding on to that. So we have ecological anthropology. Um, there's a lot to be learned from anthropology that's actually 21st century, and a lot of research done there. And what ecological anthropology means is people out in the world and the perception of the world. Uh, Post-colonial and Chinese philosophy of science. Now, having spent so much time around and going to the same Chinese doctor for 20, 30 years, uh, I've come and I've now appreciated that a lot of science is not necessarily in the Western canon. And so what we do is that we can actually learn from others. And Chinese medicine is good because there's a lot of Chinese doctors and they, they have practices, they have very established procedures, diagnostic routines. But what happens is that you can't actually judge Chinese medicine because it's one of their philosophy from Western medicine. Uh, Peacock Lee is the one that I like that wrote the book, and what she says is you can't judge a cat in a dog show and you can't judge a dog in a cat show. And that's why we end up in philosophy of science. Um, service science is a field that I worked a lot with at IBM. When we move from the product world into the service world, my bet is that almost all of you in this class will be working in a service business. You'll probably not be working in manufacturing, you'll be working in service, and that's something that's shifted, and, and the new science system there. Um, systemic design, uh, right now there's a conference going on uh, relating system thinking and design, and the designers and design thinking has come into, the, uh, into this world. And then practice theory, which is understanding how people do things, reproductive, social practice, those sorts of things. So all the new research we've been adding is, is in this in these realms. Okay, so the research that I'm actually doing, uh, from in, uh, four years ago, I found a group in Toronto called the System Changes Learning Circle. This is an informal group. Um, the premise was easy. This was a learning system. I was looking at people and I asked, I want people, here's a commitment. This project is 10 years long. We're going to meet every three weeks for 10 years. And it's happened. So the people have been sticking with me, they, and we're learning on this. But the question is, is systems change different from systems thinking? What do they mean by systems change? Because people are talking about systems change, but it's like, what do they mean by that? Is how is systems change different from change? And one of the, the funny things along this is, um, since I'm on the internet so much, I've registered domain names. No one has ever registered the name systemschanges.com. Systems, plural, and changes, plural, because I guess people only think that system changes only once. Systemchanges.com is registered, but no one's thinking that they have multiple times. And so the OECD working on systems change, we have Stanford Social Innovation Review working on systems change, the United Nations working on it, and this forum for the future, uh, the, uh, they had a meeting, the Kong Foundation, and they were working on systems change, but they actually didn't define anything. So for those of you who are, are taking, have they taken organization behavior yet? No? They have to take it, right? Coming up fourth year? Yeah, I think so. Do you guys have to take organizational behavior? Okay, I will give you advice. This is actually for a master's program. What happens is that when you're in school, people think of organization behavior think it's the most useless class while you're in school. Ten years later, it turns out it is the most useful class you will ever take because it deals with people. And how do you deal with people? That's what you're going to be doing in your job. As soon as you graduate, you're going to get into all these organizations and they are all about people and managing people's expectations. You have to manage your boss. How do you, do you know how to manage your boss? Do you know why your boss is making decisions? Do you know why other people are making decisions the way they make them? 
So one of the fundamental ideas that you will learn in the organization behavior class is what class has been called change management. Because if they're going to come and do something, put in a new subway system, if they're going to change the health programs, they have what's called change management. And all this is attributed to this the scholar named uh, Kurt, it's actually pronounced Levine, and we we'll call him Kurt Lewin. Uh, but they have this idea of unfreeze the system, change the system, and then refreeze the system. But if you actually do the scholarly work, it turns out that Lewin never actually said that. He never actually wrote that. So people that think that you can actually take a system, unfreeze it, change it, and then refreeze it in a new way, that doesn't really happen. A reorganization of the company that happens, they decide that this, this product is dead, they're gonna rework and, and send people work on a different product, and they get them try to shift the people, it never works as cleanly as they want. So organizational change, if people are coming from this, this way, this is um, not necessarily a good direction to go. You will have to take a strategy course. In the strategy course, you may encounter Henry Mintzberg work. He talks about intended strategy. So you have the intended strategy, which has two parts. That has a deliberate strategy, which are things that happen, and then you have the unrealized strategy, which are things that you thought you were going to do <coughs> that never actually turn out. From there, you also have the emergent strategy, which is all the things that you deal with that you never thought about, and that's the realized strategy. So this is a, a, a uh, this is compatible with system thinking approach, and so this also comes in with the idea. Minsberg is really good. He has and one of the ideas is that plans are useless, but planning is essential. Plans are useless, but planning is essential. And this is compatible, as I said before, with the learning stream that they have in systems. When you have an opportunity to learn more about your customer, more about your competitors, that's where you shouldn't be investing your time because there's things that are going to happen in your strategy that you haven't thought about. Now, this has been a year when, for those of you who actually are interested, um, where we've been doing a lot of work uh, in the system changes learning circle. So there are, you, I pointed to you at the presentations. There's lots of places where you can find those. Um, this, is, this journal article is um, still being published or waiting for the DOI, and I've been doing other presentations. I'm on YouTube. I'll tell you one of the advantages if you actually want to follow me on YouTube, there's a pause button. Because people kind of, I know in my lectures, people kind of get full with their brain, and sometimes it's better to just put some pause button and say, I'll come back in a couple of days and watch later. So this is actually the system changes learning model that we're using. Um, and we're focused on, firstly, having triggering conversations. And so when we come in and we talk to people about systems, everyone has a different view of what a system is, and we need to actually discuss that. Now, I learned a lot of this from actually Susu up here on the front where, and so I was explaining that uh, she and I uh, didn't quite overlap. We were teaching in Finland together, and I came in, uh, was they, when they had the new program called Creative Sustainability in Finland in 2010, there was a requirement of two system thinking courses, and they asked, would I teach them? And great, okay, I wrote two courses. We taught them, but it was a wrong thing to do because the sort of stuff I'm talking to you about is hard. <coughs> Especially in an interdisciplinary program, we have people from different countries, people who have studied different things, because this was a graduate program, so you would have engineers, business students, real estate students, ecologists, all these different people coming together. And so you need to have a conversation first to set a mindset where people can actually communicate with each other and learn the language. And systems are a good language because parts and holes are easy to get around. What part are you talking about? What hole are you talking about? How do they fit together? From there, we, we're focused on doing and progressing the practices. And, and the, the process and the reason it's going to take 10 years is we are researchers, but when we build research, it's only useful if people use it. And so we spend a lot of time working on ideas, and then we spend a lot of time working on language people. Do you understand this? Do you not understand this? Are we using the right word? Does it translate badly? We have the theory part of it, and then we have the formal progressing of the methods, because you're going to need to go step by step through things. So before I said to think about synthesis, synthesis is putting things together. 
And I talk about the automobile and how the engine fits into the car. Now, one of the things I've learned in doing this is we tend to think about synthesis as putting things together, but um, when we actually think about synthesis, have you thought about putting things together in time? So when we think about systems, we often think structure, and we think about the arrangement of the parts, but we should maybe think about arrangement in time, that things don't fit together in the right sequence. And sequence matters when you put things together. And so within the system changes learning circle, we are focused much more on time. Um, and you can see, if you look at a tree, that's how time happens. And what we are focused on, our research is on the rhythmic shifts. And if you think about what happens in your body as a system, most of the time we don't think of what happens in our body. It's when something hurts. It's a rhythmic shift that has happened. In organizations, most of your operations class, most of the time things run just fine. But then you have a rhythmic shift. And that's what we're researching right now is the rhythmic shifts that make the difference. When you have a system, there are, again, I said look outside of the system. The question is how things fit together in what we call a texture. If you put it together with something, we have a system down here and we have a texture, it's how it all fits together. So in music, we have the individual musicians, we treat them as a system, but when you put them all together, they kind of blend all together and it's music when it's together. Sequencing matters. Having a musician start on the wrong beat, really bad. Finally, uh, we've been working across this idea about causality, because when you, you, a lot of what you study in business is if you do X, then Y will happen. Unfortunately for us, that's a little bit too much like water skiing. If you control everything, when you go water skiing, you get the boat, you get the skis, you go up the water, you are con controlling everything. Maybe we should think more about surfing. When you think about surfing, you actually don't control a lot. You go up there to the board, you sit on the board, and you wait for the wave. When the wave comes, that's when you get up. And the other thing that happens, though, is with other people in the water. So you're not just negotiating the water, you have to actually watch other people around you so they don't run into each other. So we're thinking about now propensity and how, that, how you could be, do things favorably. And for those of you who are into, um, into Chinese philosophy, a lot of this comes from Sun Tzu, that you want to actually attack when the time is right, when you have a strong position. So the way we step through this is um, through this process, and this is very much, and we use a medical metaphor, so the only way a system changes is if you go from within. Telling a system that they should change, so someone telling me I should lose 10 pounds does nothing. I have to decide myself that I'm going to lose 10 pounds, right? So first thing, you have to recognize the contextual influences. Will my family permit this? Do I have time? Am I going to be too stressed out to work? We look at the rhythmic disorders. What's happened if, if, I, if I actually go vegan, my energy is not as high, how does that influence things? I have to tell you that I have to go to the bathroom more often because I'm eating a lot of roughage these days. Uh, progressive likelihoods. What what will what, what are the likely best ways of doing this? So how do I change the who cooks in the family, who's gonna rebel, those sorts of things? And then we get the reordering of the pacing because different people will do different things. Uh, that's pretty well the end of my talk. Uh, if people are really interested, they can come two o'clock and hear the, uh, the, uh, the in-depth talk. Uh, the system changes learning circle. Uh, this is the four of us in Toronto. There's other people who are expanding it. Uh, the creative systemic research platform, Susu is here if you want to talk to someone who's actually in Spain and uh, in the group here. Uh, we have a uh, online forum that we're actually working with the Open Learning Commons. So if you go to the, uh, openlearning.cc, you'll find um, where we chat. Uh, I blog at coevolving.com. And that's talk. So um, thank you very much. For your <laughs>
think one of the things that in counter systems, especially people just getting started with it, is, is it's, it's dense. It seems really complex. Do you have any advice for, for how people can get started with it and using it uh, in, yeah. in their daily lives? <coughs> yeah, so, the, yeah. So, so the, important, the important thing for me is you go back to the five W's, the why, where, what, who. And, and so what happens, particularly when you get your first job and you're working through these things, is you are told to do things. And the question you should be asking is, why am I doing this? When do I do this? <coughs> Who gets impacted by doing this? And so what I try to encourage you when you are thinking about the system, people think about the system, they talk about the system, but you are all part of the system. If you get, on, if you get hired into a company, you are part of the system. So as an example, um, one of the reasons for my success at IBM, I was there for 28 years, they didn't fire me, was I actually come from a small business. My father was a, uh, we started actually in a restaurant, Chinese restaurant, and my father was a, a retailer, sold furniture, he sold electronics, these sort of things. I came into IBM, but it's a company of 100,000 people, you know, a couple of, and, and, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50,000 people, and the question is, I, you know, do you work in, I, I was an employee of IBM Canada, there's no mistake, my family, for the 28 years I was with IBM, I was working for IBM Canada. But I'll have you know that I also have a million miles on Air Canada, which means that I, had to, I was flying all around the world, and that's because who told me that I couldn't work somewhere else inside of IBM? So you, you're here, you're in Spain, you know, you actually have the advantage that you can actually work in the EU. So no one, so you're working in a company, before you think about, if you, if you get into a job, and everyone does this, if you get into a job, you go, oh, this job, uh, this is one job, I really hate this job. Get an intercompany transfer. Say, you know, I want to work in England. Can I work in that branch in England? You know, I can do this job here. There's an opening out there. I can do that. So the systems that you think about, you think bigger. And ask the question, and someone says, oh, we can't do that. And then you can ask someone else. They say, well, but someone else actually transferred, and they got another job, they worked somewhere else. So there's a lot of possibilities with systems that we don't think about. A lot of processes that are in place, but you don't always have to follow. Like, the best thing is you understand the rule book better than the people that actually wrote the rule book. So, so I'll, I'll tell you how I exited IBM, which was actually after Someone actually told me that when I had a when I, when I had a bad manager, they're going to have a problem. See. So, so I was having uh, I actually had a manager I was not working out very well with, and so the uh, I went uh, IBM has a process where you go to the second level manager and they manage your career. And so uh, she, she actually literally scratched her head and said, "I don't know what to do with you." And I said, um, "Do you have any uh, early retirement program?" She says, "Those are usually not initiated by the employee." And then six months later, they said, you know, would you like to retire early? It's like, oh, thank you. That'd be great. But that was the system. They, the company actually has these programs inside, and they're well designed, and they have circumstances. And, and so it's like, OK, so I'm a happy IBM retiree. Uh, I like the company. For those of you who are not so familiar with IBM, <coughs> my son's explained it to me. IBM was the Google of, our, of, my, of my generation. Right, so if you think IBM, you don't know IBM well, it's like, okay, today I'd be working at Google. Actually, the, the photograph of me when I was working on a, a project, um, I, uh, I, I have a, I'm standing beside the sign of this building I was working on. That building is now in the middle of the Googleplex because I was working on a project that was a Xerox part, you know. Any questions about systems? Any questions about anything? I can tell you about Canada. <laughs> Susan, <laughs> go ahead. Yes. Um, I really like the concept of if you're going to get into the systems, try to understand that you're an individual in a bigger system. And so to understand the individual and their context of the bigger system. When you're talking about freeze, unfreeze, freeze, this is a really good place to start thinking because you know when you're looking at this freeze, unfreeze, freeze, 
in an organization, everybody thinks that you can just do this in a linear fashion. So if you're going to start thinking about how to apply systemic thinking, it's not in a linear. So if you can always think about you as an individual inside a bigger system, can you explain some ex examples, more examples of freeze, unfreeze, freeze, and the communities that get cut within that process? Uh, okay, uh, I'll give you a, an interesting example from IBM, uh, actually from knowledge management. This is the, what happens when IBM went into consulting? So in 1993, um, uh, so, so when I, when I joined IBM in 1985, and by, 19, um, by 1989, IBM was in a near-death situation. You don't think about a, about a company that's in the Fortune 100 or Fortune 10, whatever it is that, that can actually go bankrupt, but it's actually possible. And so they had a near-death experience. They brought in a new chairman, um, Lou Gerstner. And what Lou Gerstner saw was that the world was turning from products, because at that point, IBM was selling hardware machines, and they needed to actually get out of that and start doing software and services. And so they formed IBM Services Company. And what he did was, he started a new services company with all these employees, and, and what he said is, these are all really smart people, but they have no skills. And so at that point, they actually and they did an education program, and they started up and educated a, a lot of people. Uh, today, IBM's <coughs> revenue, over 50% of IBM's revenue is in services. It's a service company. So when you talk about unfreeze, change, freeze, when you unfreeze, you say, you've been selling these big mainframe computers, and we're gonna change everything, Firstly, you, you'll get some of the older people, because IBM goes back in those days, I actually had people on the uh, in headquarters client team that were the typewriters. IBM used to do typewriters, and the guy says, no, 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 I can't, I can't do this, I'm going to retire. And so you'll lose some people along the way. Um, you have also the opportunity for new people to come in, because they're people with services, business experiences, and they come into the company. And then you think you're going to refreeze, but it doesn't actually work that way, because it's a learning organization. And so what they thought was going to happen was that uh, there'd be a very, very small services business and a very large hardware selling computer, and that's not what happened. They had that transformation. So the refreeze doesn't happen as you think would happen, and they reorganized very, very many times. A good example? Yeah. Okay. Anyone have questions? Um, would you think of um, commons as you uh, actually introduced the word for a second uh, uh, as a buffer for transition, for example, uh, uh, functioning as a uh, type of resource that we can uh, tap into maybe in a disconnected fashion uh, rather, I mean, not to avoid losses in uh, the parts of the system, meaning the, the personal, uh, the, the people in, employed, maybe looking at common resources could, could be a strategy. Yeah, yes. So Mar Marco is a great straight man for me because I have a book called Open Innovation Learning. You can go to openinnovationlearning.com and write about it. And there's a history of IBM um, in, in working in open source software. And so those of you who are familiar with open source software, you have contributors and people contribute, many companies work on it, it's not proprietary, and you have a commons approach. Now that doesn't mean when you have a common good that there's not investments. And so for those of you familiar with Linux software, um, in the book I talk about not only IBM investing the first billion dollars into Linux, but the second billion dollars into Linux. Google has a lot of open source software and they develop that way. Facebook opened, uh, all up. so it's now become a common way of working. But as you think about your businesses, a lot of times when they say things are proprietary, you have to ask why. Why is it that you need to hide or, you know, like, so 
Like my friend Steve Heckel had this expression about, about working with companies. You can have games against competitors, or you can have games with customers. A game with a competitor is military. You take, you know, you go in and you attack and you do all the strategizing. But sometimes it's better to have a game with a customer. Customers actually do not like locking. They like to be able to say, we can do this. And so industry standards are quite important. Um, I was just reading, um, last couple of weeks, for those of you, I still watch technology. So for those of you who are doing Internet of Things, and you have um, things, so your, your uh, phone can control the lights going on in your, off in your house. Like I actually can look and see who's at my front door in Toronto right now. Um, that's not a problem. Uh, those are all working on protocols that are not just be standards. There's just a standard that just came out, Matter 1.0, so that Apple and Google devices and all these things could talk together with a new standard. That's open, open source and working with open standards and working things together. There's no reason that everyone should have to be in one world or the other. And it's actually in the interest of companies to be part of the open standard and working in larger communities. So when you get into a business situation where you might think, oh, that person's my competitor, you might ask the question, are there parts where we could share? Are there parts where we can do things together so that we have, in effect, the, the statement is a bigger pie? You don't want to just take a pie and cut up the pie into parts. You want to see if you can create a bigger pie and then you may benefit more than everyone else. One of the things I learned about IBM, and you don't get this in business school, because I was in business school, as you are, no one actually teaches you how to be the leading company. They teach you how to be a competitor and how to work against the leader, but if you are going to be a leader and do things differently, system thinking helps, because you have to put things together in different ways, because you can. If you go to the industry leader, you, leader, you set the pace, you don't follow other people. Thank you. Yes? What would be your advice if you work in a company that has absolutely no system because the CEO has a startup spirit and does not really do And having these different environments uh, still. So some companies formalize and they have the 10% time uh, when you work on other projects. And so um, that's an interesting question. With, so if you were a company that actually subscribed to that, then that's good. And you should actually say, this is my 10% time. I'm, and I am working on things for my company, not for this month, not for next month, but for maybe a year from now. But I need 10% of my time to do that. If they say no, you might look for a different company. But if someone came to me, if I had an employee who came to me, uh, I managed employees before, and they said, I'm working on a project, only 10% of my time, I will manage it, I will report to you and tell you the progress I'm making. It may take me a year to get there. Will you support me on this? <coughs> and I would say, that's an employee I want to have. I, I want employees with ideas. I want people to do things differently. I don't want a robot. Now, if you, if you are if working for a company that wants robots, now yeah, try somewhere else. <laughs> Anyone else? there for today and I'll see you all on Thursday and thanks so much again for coming and giving us that very inspiring talk.